قدرا ربنا أعلاك قدرا يا إمام الأنبياء أنت في الوجدان حي أنت للعينين ضي Before we start speaking about the topic of this lecture, I would like to go on a quick review of the basics that you learned in the first year about the digestive system. So, first of the first, when we speak about the digestive system, guys, I want you to remember that the digestive system is classified into two main parts. Okay? So, digestive system is classified into two main parts. The first part is what we refer to it as the gastrointestinal tract, abbreviated as GIT, okay? Or other name, alimentary canal, okay? This is the first part. So when you say GI system, it's a misconception because GI, the gastrointestinal tract, is part of the digestive system. The digestive system, again, is classified into the alimentary canal, and we call them the digestive accessory organs, okay? So there are organs related to the digestive system. You have to know about them. The first part of the digestive system, the alimentary canal, or the GIT, or GI tract, is made of the oral cavity, as you know, six structures. The oral cavity is the mouth. After that, you have the pharynx, the balloon, Esophagus, the marine, bottles, stomach, small intestine, large intestine, six structures, okay? So those are the six structures that form the gastrointestinal tract. What about the accessory organs? We have another six organs related to the digestive system. Those accessory organs are the three major salivary glands in the head and neck area, okay? And those are the parotid gland, if you hear about it, okay? The parotid okay? The smetophobidrim, mouths, infection. We have the submandibular salivary gland and sublingual salivary gland, below the mandible and below the tongue, okay? Three major salivary glands, okay? Are very important, we will speak about them. <coughs> And in the abdomen, within the abdominal cavity, another three organs. The largest organ and the largest gland in your body, liver, the exocrine part, the pancreas, okay? And the last one, the storage of bile, the infrared bladder, the marat, okay? The chazmin bile, osara safrawi. Bile is produced by the liver, by the liver, remember this but it is stored and concentrated in the gallbladder. So it does not produce in the gallbladder. Gallbladder is just a storage, okay? So liver, gallbladder, and pancreas. So remember, when we say digestive system, we mean the gastrointestinal tract with the six structures and the digestive accessory organs, six organs, okay? So remember this, this is the digestive system. Now, when we speak about the alimentary canal, we further sub-classify the alimentary canal into superior gastrointestinal tract and inferior GI tract, okay? The superior GI is made of oral cavity, the mouth, pharynx, esophagus, stomach, and the first part of the small intestine, duodena, which means Number 12. Why we call it number 12? You remember from the first year? Because it's as long as the breadth of your 12 fingers. So if you put your fingers beside each other, those are eight. With additional four, this will be the length of the duodenum in your body. Okay? That's why they refer to it as duodenum. Okay? Which is a Latin for 12. So, until duodenum, this is the upper GI tract. After that, you will have the jejunum. Jejunum means empty. 
and the most old or twisted part, iliac. Iliac also means twisted because it's so much twisted. Jejunum and iliac are the other parts of the small intestine and the large intestine. Mm -hmm. What are the components of the large intestine? Cecum and appendix. Remember, cecum is Latin for obliterated. So it's an obliterated sac. It does not open. It is a blind ended sac. Okay? Because it will be open. You have only one opening in the large intestine at the right time. So it has to be closed. Okay? So the cecum and the piriform appendix. Then you have the ascending colon, transverse colon. Descending colon, the S-shaped sigmoid colon, and the straight part, rectum, which means straight, rectum and anal canal. So all these will be the lower GI. So the border is the junction between eudenum and jejunum. Okay? Eudenum is the upper part, jejunum is with lower part of the GI. So today we will start with the first part or the first structure in the alimentary canal, which is the oral cavity, okay, the mouth. Before we start, remember, in anatomy, when we study any region, we always look to the boundaries or the borders of that region, then we look into the contents. So we first look what is the roof of this region, what's the floor, what are the walls, where are the openings, then the contents, what are there? Chairs, monitor, computer, whatever, okay? So we look to the boundaries, then to the components. So when we define the oral cavity, we define it by its borders and its components. The borders, it's the cavity or the space that extends anteriorly from the labial fissure. Labial fissure is the space between upper and lower limb, okay? from the labial fissure anteriorly all the way posteriorly to the pharynx okay until the pharynx so these are the borders and it contains what does it contain two main things we related to the teeth and the tongue so the teeth and the tongue if we look to this oral cavity it's further subdivided by the teeth by the dentition okay into a vestibule which means an empty space and the oral cavity proper. And remember in anatomy also, when you read the word proper, it means the main part. Okay, so oral cavity proper, which means, in other words, the main part of the oral cavity. So we have the vestibule and the oral cavity proper. The vestibule is not that important, you just need to know its borders. It is this sulcus or this space, which is the uh, border inside by the gum, left gingiva and teeth, and from outside by the lips and cheek. Okay? So by the lips and cheek from outside, by the teeth and the gum from inside. So this space here is the vestibule, while the space that occupied when you close your teeth, okay? by your teeth, inside the teeth, all of this, which contains mainly the tongue, is the main oral cavity, the oral cavity proper, okay? So this is here, the oral cavity proper, and this here is the vestibule. Of course, both are parts of the oral cavity and they communicate with each other. How they communicate behind the teeth, as you see here, behind the third molar, there is a communication between the vestibule and the oral cavity proper, and they also communicate at what we call it freeway space. The freeway space. What is the freeway space? Have you ever heard of this term? Freeway space. Now, as you're sitting down, you are closing your mouth. Does your teeth attach to each other, the upper dentition, attaching the lower dentition? No. So there is a space there, two to four millimeters, varies from individual to the other. This is the freeway space. The freeway space is the space between the upper and lower dentition when the mandible is at physiological rest. 
What we mean by physiological rest? That means the muscles of mastication. You studied them. That control the movement of the mandible are relaxed. When these muscles are relaxed, the four muscles of mastication, that means you will see that the mandible is a little bit separated from the maxilla. And there is a space between the upper and lower. So this is what we call it a freeway space. So it's actually temporal, a physiological rest. If you clench your teeth, the space will disappear. Okay? So this is the freeway space. Second thing, when we speak about the oral cavity proper, the vestibule doesn't have that clinical significance, as you see, but the oral cavity proper does, because it contains the tongue and its border. Now, in different anatomical textbooks, you will see different terms, and there is some kind of misleading information or misconceptions. So in order to avoid confusion, remember this, when we speak about the roof of the oral cavity, it is mainly made by the hard palate. Okay? By the hard palate, not the soft palate. The soft palate forms the roof of the oral part of the pharynx. So the soft palate is actually in the pharynx. The hard palate is the roof for the oral cavity which separates the oral cavity below from the nasal cavity above. What's the difference between hard palate and soft palate? Hard palate is made of hard tissue, so it is bony component made, okay? Which is the palatine processes of maxilla and the horizontal blades of palatine bone. So this is the hard palate. But what about the soft palate? It's a soft tissue, it's muscular, skeletal muscle. Okay? So that's the difference. The junction actually now between the hard palate and the soft palate is located at which we call it oropharyngeal isthmus, if you hear about it, which is the space, the narrow space that communicates the oral cavity anteriorly with the pharynx posteriorly. So the opening between oral cavity anteriorly and the pharynx posteriorly is a narrow opening which is here. You can see these borders. This area, this is which we call it oropharyngeal isthmus. Oro from the oral cavity, pharyngeal from the pharynx, and isthmus is the straight. Straight, يعني مضيق, like Swiss canal. So isthmus is a narrow passage between two large spaces. Okay, like Swiss canal, communicating the Red Sea with Mediterranean Sea. Okay, so it's a straight, it's an isthmus. Okay. So oropharyngeal isthmus is the narrow opening between oral cavity anteriorly and oropharynx. Oropharynx, so that means the oral part of the pharynx. Okay? The pharynx posterior. We spoke about this opening. Let's go to the components of the oral cavity. We said two components, teeth and tongue. We start with the teeth. The teeth are made of two sets in the humans. You know, we have the primary, or the deciduous, and we have the permanent dentition, okay? Asnan daimim, asnan labani, deciduous, labani, or primary, awad, okay? The deciduous teeth are five in each quadrant, khamsi, kulli quadrant, central incisor, al-faqa al-markazi, lateral incisor, okay? Kenai, first molar, second molar. Five in each quadrant, the total is We have 20 deciduous. The first, remember this is as a general rule. Lower teeth erupts before upper teeth. So if I ask you which erupts first, the lower central or the upper central incisor? The lower central incisor. Lower erupts before the upper. Okay? Second thing. This teeth starts to erupt by the age of six months. Okay? So during the infancy period. Infancy period. What does infancy mean? Infant. During the neurological development, infants and able to speak. So during the first year, first year of the life of the human, we refer to it as infant. Okay? The first month is new name which means newly born, okay, child. First year, where he cannot speak, we call it infant, okay? So during infancy period, at the age of six months, the first 
just to start the rap will be the lower central incisors, okay? Lower central incisors by the age of six months. The order of eruption will be as follows. The central incisors, remember, lower before other. But in general, central incisors, lateral incisors, shubah ibu, what's it? After? <laughs> First molar, canine, second so the canine erupts after this first motor. Why? Because it has the largest root. So until it roots completely form, it will take longer time to erupt than the first motor. Okay? Because it has the largest root. Okay? Its root is larger than the roots of the molars. So central, lateral, first molar, canine, second molar. The second molar usually erupts at the age of two years, okay, during childhood. From the same you will have a complete, at the age of two years, around the age of two years, you will have a complete deciduous dentition. This dentition will continue until the age of six, okay, once the child go to the school. Al-Umar said this means, now the deciduous dentition will start to be shilling off with the use of the shoe replaced by permanent dentition. What is the first permanent tooth to the right? Oh. So this is important. Now, before answering this question, actually, you have to know the number of the permanent dentition. 32. Yes, 32. Which means there are eight in each quadrant, not five. If you look to the permanent dentition, you have some additional teeth, we call them premolars. So you have central incisors, we have lateral incisors, we have a canine, then premolars. First premolar, second premolar, three before, before the molar. Then you have a first molar, second molar, and additional one also, third molar. So the two premolars with the third molar are the additional three ones. The third molar takes longer time to erupt after others. So they call it the wisdom. Okay? So that's why they call it the third molar or the wisdom. First, very can close to erupt. They start to erupt at which age again? Six years. The shoe of what's it? First molar. Good. Why? It's not the central inside. It's this one. And the first molar. None of these. Because there is no preceding deciduous teeth. So, the first deciduous teeth in the cap has an amount of central inside. This one has a preceding lateral inside. This one has a preceding canine. This one has a preceding first molar. And this one has a preceding second molar. So all these teeth have to wait until the root of the deciduous teeth resorts and fall down, then they erupt. However, the first molar does not have any preceding deciduous molar. So it has a empty space in the front of it. So it erupts fast. So at the age of six years, the first molar erupts, followed by the central incisor, lateral incisor, first premolar. Then canine, again, because it has the largest and the widest root at this time, okay? The canine. After canine, you have second premolar. Then at the age of 12 years, look, six years, another six years, you will have the second molar. Okay, so by the age of 12 years, you will have a complete permanent dentition by the age of the second molar, with the exception of the wisdom tooth, which usually take longer, until 18 years and more. So if you calculate it actually, you'll see that each permanent molar, we speak about these molars, will take six years to form. The first molar, six years. Second molar, 12 years. So another six years. And at the age of 18 now, another six years, you will start having the wisdom. Okay? Even if it cares. So that's all about the teeth. What about now the tongue? The more important structure in the oral cavity is the tongue. 
what is the function? As you see here, it's a muscular organ, so it's made of a group of skeletal muscles that join together and we cover them with a mucous membrane. Okay? Mucous membrane, that means we have what? Epithelial cells and basal lamina. Okay? And they have the ability to secrete the mucus. So it's a movable, don't forget the word mobile, because it's not fixed, it's mobile. Mobile, muscular organ that is covered with mucous membrane. So we have skeletal muscles. Skeletal indicates two things, guys. Remember this voluntary movement. What does the skeletal indicate? Skeletal indicates two things. First thing, bony attachment. If you have skeletal muscle, voluntary. If you have muscle, you can control it voluntary. You can't have any attachment to the bone. You can't have a skeletal muscle. You can't have a striated muscle. Like the ones you're going to see in the esophagus. Okay, or some in the tongue. It's a mean striated, not skeletal. Skeletal, it's voluntary, and it has a bony attachment. So those actually are, in general, they refer to them as skeletal muscles. But as you will see, when we move to the muscles of the tongue, it's actually intrinsic striated muscles and extrinsic skeletal muscles. I will explain this later on. So the tongue is made of a group of muscles, voluntary controlled skeletal muscles and covered by mucous membrane. Okay? And it's very important because it undergoes four important functions. Anybody know some of the functions of the tongue? Taste, speech, mastication, it press food against the heart palate. And a very important function, swallowing, deglutition. Okay? Swallowing. So those are all important functions are contributed by the tongue and other organs, of course. When we look to the embryological origin now of the tongue, guys, this is important. The tongue actually develops from two different origins. One from the oral cavity, the anterior two thirds, and that's why it's located within the oral cavity. The anterior two thirds of the tongue develop from within the oral cavity, and we refer to them as the oral part of the tongue. While the posterior third of the tongue develops within the pharynx, that is the room. And that's why we refer to this posterior third as the pharyngeal part of the tongue. And both parts, as they develop, they will join each other at the border between the pharynx and the oral cavity. Okay? And since both the posterior third or the pharyngeal part and the anterior two thirds, the oral part, have different embryological origins, so they must carry out different functions, different physiological functions. Okay? Different embryological origins means different anatomical structural okay, formation and different physiological functions. So the oral part, the anterior two thirds, is different somehow from the pharyngeal part, posterior part. Before we go in more details about the anatomy of the tongue, it's important to locate the geographic okay, appearance of the tongue. In other words, the surfaces of the tongue. So when we look to the tongue, the most important area is the upper surface, which is opposite to the palate. Okay? This is the palatal surface, or as commonly we refer to it as the dorsum of the tongue. What does dorsum mean? The back. So this is actually the superior surface, is the back of the tongue. Okay? The dorsum of the tongue, or the palatal surface of the tongue. While the inferior surface here will be the ventral surface of the tongue. The anterior surface of the tongue. So here is the ventral surface. The ventral surface is opposite to the floor of the mouth. While the dorsum is opposite to the palate. Okay? So we have a dorsum, upper surface, a ventral surface. We have margins and tip 
the apex of the tongue, okay? Margins and tip of the tongue, those are usually in located opposite to the teeth. So once you have injury to your tongue by your teeth, when you bite your tongue, usually you bite the margins or the tip of the tongue, okay? So because they are opposite to the teeth. And one of the most important areas of the tongue is the root of the tongue. In general, this is very important because you remember we said it has skeletal muscles. Tongue for your skeletal muscles. <coughs> skeletal muscles in order to move the tongue, these muscles must, must have bony attachment. So the root of the tongue is the bony attachment of the skeletal muscles of the tongue. And this root is the attachment anteriorly to the mandible and posteriorly to what? Hyoid. Okay? To the hyoid. So this is the root of the tongue. The root of the tongue is the bar which connects the tongue anteriorly to the mandible and posteriorly to the hyoid bone. And it's responsible for movements okay, of the tongue. So these are the surfaces and borders of the tongue. Dorsal, ventral, tip and margin, and the root. We will start with the most important one, which is the dorsal of the tongue. When we look to the dorsal of the tongue now, first, what you're going to see is an inverted V-shaped sulcus here. You cannot easily distinguish it here, but here it is. This is the first structure you will notice, which we refer it to as the terminal sulcus, or sulcus terminalis. This is the landmark of the fusion between the pharyngeal bar and the oral bar of the tongue. If you remember, I just mentioned they both, the tongue has two embryological origins that they grow and fuse together. Once they fuse and join, you see the border of joining here as the sulcus terminalis. And actually, they call it sulcus terminalis. In English, this is a Latin. In English, it means terminal sulcus. Because it's the terminal part of the arterial reserves of the tongue, where the pharyngeal part starts. Okay? The sulcus terminalis now, if you look carefully, I can demarcate it here by this line. At the tip of sulcus terminalis, you will see a small bit of here. You see this bit here? This is which we call it foramen sica. Foramen orbini. But this is not a real foramen. It's a bit complex. So it's sica. Like the sica with large intestine. It's a closed, obliterated foramen. Foramen sica means a blind-ended foramen or an obliterated foramen. In other words, it's just a bit of us. This foramen cecum represents something embryological. It represents the superior remnant of thyroglucal duct. Okay? What is the thyroglucal duct? Thyrothyroid gland. Glucal, Greek for tongue. Thyroglucal duct is the duct that connects the tongue in the mouth with the thyroid gland in the root of the neck. Now, because during embryological development, the cells, the stem cells, which will form the thyroid gland, usually originate here in the tongue. And they migrate through a duct, a canal, down from the tongue until the root of the neck. There, they start to increase in number, undergo mitosis and increase in number. So we call them proliferate. Proliferate means increase in number, and after proliferation, they become specialized cells. They differentiate into which we call them follicular cells of the thyroid gland. Follicular cells are the cells of the thyroid gland, which are responsible for secreting the hormone should they present thyroid gland? Thyroxine. Or triiodothyroid. T4 or T3. So these cells which will form the thyroid gland originate here and migrate through a duct until the root of the neck. Then they will differentiate to form the thyroid gland. Once the thyroid gland formed now, no need for the duct. So the duct will start to be replaced by fibrous tissue. In that section, fibrous tissue in the middle, and this fibrous tissue will expand superiorly and inferiorly. Superiorly will continue until the foramen cecum and ends here. 
Okay. So the foreign income will be the superior remnant of the thyroid blue cell duct. But the inferior remnant of the thyroid blue cell duct will be another thing. We usually refer to it as the pyramidal loop of the thyroid gland. Okay? What else? Sulcus terminalis. At the tip of sulcus terminalis, we found foramen cecum. What else you can see on the dorsum of the tongue? You can see these folds, very large folds. And you can see those small shaped bits. If you look to them under the microscope, they look like mushroom. All of these foldings, so, in other words, if you look to the dorsum, it's folded. It's not smooth. It's rough because it's folded into so many projections. These small projections, we refer to them as papillae. Papillae means finger-like projection. Okay? These finger-like projections or lingual papillae are very important. They are located only in the dorsum of anterior two-thirds of the tongue. What's the function of these papillae? You see them, lingual papillae, and it's made to people. Filiform papillae, the fungi form, they are like mushroom, those are the fungi form papillae, distributed all over the dorsum. The circumvalate, or now they call them valate, valate means large, circumcircular, okay? So either you call them circumvalate papillae or just valate papillae. Those are 8 to 20 in number, as you see there, they are located anterior to what? Sulcus terminalis. How you distinguish them? The valet, the largest ones, are anterior to sulcus terminalis. The fungi form are distributed in the dorsum. The linear elevations, those are linear, you see them? At the margin of the tongue, these are the filiate papillae. And those are actually poorly developed in a human. Okay? Since you see him, they here very well developed. This indicates that this tongue is from an animal. Actually, this is a cat tongue. It's not a human tongue. Yes. So these are the free family. Those are the valet family. Those are the fungi form family. And the most numerous ones, which you cannot see them by naked eye, we call them filiform family. Filly like hair follicle. So they go like hair follicle if you look at them under the microscope. And they are actually keratinized. The remaining ones are not keratinized. The fungi form, it's like mushroom, like fungus. Those are indicating the fungi form. All of these hairy shapes on the dorsum are the filly form. Those are the foliate, the linear, and those are the large phalate. So the only one characterized are the filiforms. What's the function of all these cavity again? Let's go to that. Increasing the surface area of the tongue. They increase the surface area of the tongue. Why? Let's go to the surface area. Let's go to the surface area. To carry out a very specific function. Taste sensation. Smell to the taste sensation. It's a special sense. In a human, we have special senses. How many special sins we have? Along with that In a human or in medicine, we have four special senses. One. The is in This is amazing. We have four organs. The four special senses, those are indicated in the full sense. Each one has its own nerve, cranial nerve, and has its own area in the brain. Okay? So we have actually four special senses. Those are the vision, the smell, the hearing, the taste. The tactile sensation, which you refer to it, is a general sense, because it's carried out by all parts of your body and by all spinal nerves okay, in your body. So it's not a special sense. So from now on, distinguish. We have general sensation and we have special sensation. The general sensation will include thermal sensation with its types. Thermal means hot and cold and warm. 
Okay, we have pain sensation with its with its different types: burning sensation, rubbing pain, whatever. Okay, so we have pain sensation, we have thermal sensation, we have tactile sensation. Whether it's a touch or a pressure. Okay, this is tactile sensation. All of these are general senses carried out by general nerve receptors. Okay, in this. But the special sensations require special receptors, special nerve, and special area in the brain. Those are the vision, the smell, the hearing, and the taste. Okay? Now, to increase the functionality of taste sensation, we need more taste receptors, which we call them taste buds. Taste buds are the taste receptors. How should I increase the number of taste receptors if I have a flat surface? Instead, I will have these folds, the lingual papillae. So more surface area, more number of receptors. The same mechanism you will see it where in the brain. You look to the brain, it's not flat. It is folded into elevations, gyri, and depressions, sulci. So more elevations, more surface area, more number of nerve cells, more neurons, okay? And that's how I increase the number of neurons more than three times by having these foldings in the brain. And here the same, I increase the number of test receptors. The test parts or test receptors, the same, are located on, on the fungi fold, the valley and the foliage. But the filiforms don't have taste receptors. As we said again, the fungiform located here. Uh, sorry, all over the dorsum. Okay? The valet are here and the foliate are here. And all have taste receptors. So any taste sensation, sweet, hello, salt, malic, bitter, more, sour, almond, whatever, okay? You will see it, Umami. You will taste it in any of these things. Receptors located either in the fungi form, on the foliate, or on the valley. Which we call it the tongue mapping of Kharita the taste, is totally a misconception. Remember this, it's a myth. If you heard about this story, this is completely wrong. Okay? This is a myth. Okay? Wherever you have a taste bud, you will have the taste sensation. Okay? So there is nothing called tongue map. This is the first thing. The second thing, I mentioned that the taste receptors are only on the fungi form, the foliate, and the valet. What about the filiform? Why they are there if they don't have taste buds or taste receptors? Because there is another sensation of the tongue. When you will burn your tongue. So, if you have a thermal sensation, general sensation, because the general air receptors are located in the filiform. That's why they don't have this part, okay? What you find there actually in the filiform is the general nerve receptor, okay? For touch, pressure, thermal, okay? These are why we have the lingual babidi. Now, if you move behind sulcus terminalis, so remember, all of this is the anterior two thirds of the tongue, guys. If I move behind sulcus terminalis into the pharyngeal tongue, the story is totally different now. There is no lingual pabili, but still I have irregularities in the surface. If you bring a scan, the gypto mushroom, and you cut the mucous membrane here and look inside, you will see aggregations, the jagmuhat, of lymphatic nodules. Do you know what's lymphatic nodules? Like lymph nodes. But those are much smaller. Those are nodules. These lymphatic nodules aggregated there in the pharyngeal part of the tongue. And they form which we call it the lingual tonsil. The lingual tonsil. The lingual tonsil. So the pharyngeal part of the tongue contains lymphocytes. It is a protective function. Okay? Totally different. Anterior two thirds, as you see, taste sensation. Posterior there is protective. It's made of aggregation of lymphatic nodules. We call them all together as lingual tonsils. Okay? 
I have a very important question now. I want to ask you, and you have to find the answer next lecture. I mentioned in the posterior fear, they are enrolling you at the building. Okay? We agree on this. The lingual capability dose, you will find it only in the oral part. Okay. Now, in the pharyngeal part, there are no lingual capability. The question is like this. Are there taste buds on the pharyngeal part of the tongue? So, if there is no lingual capability, does this mean there are no taste buds or there will be taste buds? So, I want the answer for this question. Okay, next time. The lingual tones, and this is important for the next lecture, to continue with the story. Now, it's considered part of which we call it Valdaya's tonsillar ring. Henrik Valdaya okay, was a German anatomist. Tell you in Germany, they, uh, they pronounce it V. So, Valdaya discovered that we have four different types of tonsils in the human body that located in the pharynx behind the nasal cavity and behind the oral cavity in the nasal pharynx and oral pharynx and they are arranged in a hexagon ring the first one in the roof of the nasal pharynx behind the nose the roof we call it the pharyngeal tonsil. I have a word. Adenoid. Pharyngeal tonsil. Lateral to it, there are small ones around the openings of the eustachian tube. Phanatostachius. Tauru alayha. You have to know this. Okay? We call them tubal tonsils. So behind the nose, we have a single pharyngeal tonsil, two tubal tonsils. If you go down behind the mouth now, you have the main, most common tonsils, the palatine tonsils, in the organs. So the palatine tonsils, and so you have pharyngeal, tubal, tintain, palatine, and one in the floor of the pharynx, in the oropharynx, in lingual. So they have a ring. That ring is very important because it forms the first line of defense in your body from any microorganism coming from outside the environment. Pharyngeal, tubals, palatine, and most important, lingual tonsil, which is this one. Hexagon ring, we call it Valdaya's tonsillar ring. Ventral surface, if we go below in the under surface of the tongue, you will see that the ventral surface is made of a very thin, very smooth, very transparent mucous membrane. Very thin, very smooth, transparent. And you can easily, if you look to it, you can easily distinguish the deep lingual vein which is supplying the tongue and the deep lingual. Oh, very easily you can see them, okay, through this mucous membrane. And this is very important clinically because it helps in which we call it sublingual absorption of drugs. If you hear about it, now if you have a drug that you want it to go directly into the circulation in less than one minute, and you don't know how to do an injection, IV, or you don't have uh, any uh, hospital facility or clinic in the street, the best way is to do the sublingual absorption of the drugs. Okay? So this is usually a very common way that could be used to benefit the patients. In the patients who should have been here to have an IV injection. So what they do, especially angina patients, the angina when you have a constriction in the coronary arteries which supply the heart. And when you need, you do exercise, the cardiac muscle needs more blood supply and more oxygenation. Unfortunately, the coronary arteries are constricted, so there is no enough blood supply. How to increase the blood supply? We need a vasodilator to relax the smooth muscle and dilate the coronary artery. 
as fast as possible. So they get the patient to keep with him always a drug called nitroglycerin. So when he starts feeling the angina pain, he directly put a pill of nitroglycerin under his tongue. I want my foot and bed. In less than one minute, the bed will be absorbed into the deep lingual vein. In less than one minute. And in less than five minutes, he will start feeling relaxation. Okay? So, so that's what's the advantage of the sublingual absorption of the drugs. The question is like this. Why do you put any drug below the tongue? in sublingual absorption of the drugs, this mechanism, it will go to the deep lingual vein, not to the artery. In less than one minute, put on the vein. Deep, thick, because the wall of the artery is much thicker than the wall of the vein. Why? Blood vessels are made in the tentacular histology, are made of three layers, tonica intima, the endothelial cell, tonica media, smooth muscle layer, the tonica media, which is much thicker in arteries than in veins. It's much thinner in veins. Then tonica adventitia. Now for drugs to be absorbed, they can easily pass through adventitia and intima. But the difficulty will be in the smooth muscle line, in tonica media. Tonica media of the arteries is much thicker, so the drug will take much, much longer to get inside the artery. However, in the vein, it takes less than one minute to be absorbed there. Okay? So it depends on the structure. In addition to this, you will see here, under the tongue, you will see a fold of the mucous membrane in the midline. This fold is very important. It is the mucous membrane itself. Instead of going straight, it will fold and continue. This folding is important because it connects the tongue to the floor of the mouth. This is called the frenula okay, of the tongue, or the lingual, uh, the lingual frenula. So this is the lingual frenula. The main what does frenulum mean? It means Alijan. You know what's that? Alijan? Yes. The one they use it to what? Connect or okay? to restrict the movement of the animals, especially the horses. So this is the frenulum. It's important because it connects the tongue and restrict its movement towards the floor of the mouth. Okay? Keeps the tongue connected with the floor of the mouth. Now the problem comes when this frenula is more than its normal size. It's larger or it extends too much anteriorly. Now in this state, when you have the frenulum extending too far anteriorly or larger than normal, that means the tongue will be more restricted in its movements than normal. Okay? So you cannot get, for example, the tip of your tongue to your palate. So at this state, you will start to have problems in articulation. If the tilde, some letters, need you to press the tongue against the phallus, the half or the primary phallus. If you have the frenulum very large, it will restrict the movements of the tongue. So this will lead in babies to suckling problems, if they have a muscle in the then the of the tongue will be clear. And later on, to speech problems. Okay? Suckling and speech problems. This is what we call it tight tongue. Sana Mahdud. The tight tongue. The tight tongue indicates that the frenulum is large and extends too far anteriorly, which limits the mobility of what? Of the tongue. So I will show you. So here, this child, it has a problem known as tight tongue. Of course, this problem can surgically 
uh, treated by any general practitioner in any clinic. Okay? So, Very simple procedure. And as easy as you treat it so, as better. Okay? So what will be here, if you see this ah, in the ah, too ah, much anteriorly, ah, leading to some cycling problems, and later on it will lead to speech problems in this child. So the best treatment is just bring a scissor, okay? sterilize. Okay, it's infected, and a tongue retractor we call it. You retract the tongue and you cut the finger. That's the whole thing. A little amount of bleeding and then So, <laughs> you start to cut the tongue here, it's stuck out. Oh, oh. So this is the tongue retractor, you see it? They place it underneath the tongue, to retract the tongue superiorly, then by the scissor you cut the finger. Look how the tongue now starts to separate from the floor of the mouth. And it's for the mouth. Sterilized goes, she has to cut them and remove the small amount of bleeding. <laughs> 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 <laughs>